We hope you enjoy the following video presentation sponsored by the C.S. Lewis Foundation. We are a nonprofit organization with a mission to equip and encourage Christians to live their faith within the world of ideas and arts. To help us continue to host events and make videos like this one, please make a donation after viewing the video by going to www.cslewis.org or clicking the link below. Thank you. He spoke on Lewis and education. Most people who speak on Lewis and education often talk about Lewis's education, which is fun and remarkable. But uh, Dr. Pike uh, spoke on the relevance of Lewis's education, view of education for today's education of the youth. And uh, Michael heard that and said, you've got to write that up. And so he did write it up. And the book, uh, C.S. Lewis on Education, its relevance for the, uh, for the contemporary world of education is now out and uh, very much regarded. And, it, and uh, Dr. Pike came to our attention through uh, the publication of this book. And so we are indebted not only to Dr. Pike, but to Dr. Michael Ward. So will you uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Mike, Mark Pike. Well, thank you for having me here today. It's wonderful to be with you. The C.S. Lewis Summer Institute at Great St. Mary Church, Cambridge. Mere education. C.S. Lewis and schooling for character in the 21st century. Before I begin, I should like to read a scripture and then for you to join with me in prayer from 2 Peter and beside this giving all diligence add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge and to knowledge temperance and to temperance patience and to patience, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, charity, love. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Please join with me in prayer. Lord God, thank you for my brothers and sisters in Christ who are here today. I ask you, Lord, please have me say what you would have me say. Your word commands us to add to our faith virtue. Lord, please would you develop Christian virtue in us and in those we lead, in those we teach. Please, Father, help us to reclaim the virtues in the academy in the church, in our schools, in our families, in our own lives. Amen. Well, C.S. Lewis gave his inaugural professorial lecture at Cambridge University in 1954, 60 years ago. Originally, it was entitled A Description of the Times published as they asked for a paper. This might in some sense be regarded as my inaugural professorial lecture. I was appointed to the chair in education at the University of Leeds one week ago, last Monday. So it's my first plenary lecture as professor of education. As far as I'm aware, Lewis never visited Leeds would have been good for the talk if he had. <laughs> Closest I could get was that J.R.R. Tolkien was professor of English there before moving to Oxford. And so I suppose if we might call it that, this inaugural is taking place 60 years after Lewis's. And the time, the age in which we live, as we shall see, is important to both. 
Now, my thesis in mere education is that Lewis has a distinctive Christian vision which he applied to education and schooling, from issues around tolerance and testing to students' work, the marking of students' work, from the curriculum to the character of the teacher, the character of the teacher. It's not necessarily that accessible to teachers and school leaders today because it's sprinkled liberally across his fiction, the Cosmic Trilogy, as well as Narnia, his ethics, his philosophy, his theology. I want to suggest to you that Lewis's educational vision, drawn from that fiction, that ethics, and that theology, can and must be applied to pressing concerns today, facing young people today. Uh, somebody asked me uh, why the faces of the children on the front cover. Um, apart from being an excuse for my own children and their friends to <laughs> appear on the front cover, um, the, the point really was, how is Lewis relevant to young people with spiky hair and iPods who are adept at social networking and social media. In other words, how can we apply Lewis's educational vision to current issues today? And most of the books out there on Lewis and education seem to me to be about his own education, about the great knock or the Oxford tutorial system, uh, rather than seeing him as having prophetic insights that can be applied to, to education today with regard to the education of young people in the 21st century. For C.S. Lewis, the application of Christian principles, say, to education, must come from Christian schoolmasters. And as I was a Christian schoolmaster for over a decade and now teach education in a university, mere education and today's lecture represents one attempt from one schoolmaster to do so. But first of all, we need to consider the times in which we live. Greg Thornbury suggested last week in Oxford that in some respects the US was about 20 years behind Europe. Um, I hope he's wrong, at least as far as secularization is concerned. I hope you in the US have more than 20 years before catching up. At Easter this year, the British Prime Minister, David Cameron, claimed that Britain was a Christian country. Front page of all the newspapers. The, Daily, sorry, the Sunday Telegraph published an exclusive with the former Archbishop of Canterbury, Rowan Williams, now Lord Williams of Oystermouth, and findings from its own survey conducted by ICM Research. According to the survey, a majority of 52% of adults in Britain regard themselves as Christian. 14% practicing and 38% non-practicing. 56% believe Britain is a Christian country. According to Lord Williams, Britain is a post-Christian nation in the sense that it's not a nation of committed believers as indicated by habitual practice, such as church attendance, although it is a Christian nation in that it is saturated by this vision of the world and its cultural memory is strongly Christian. Callum Brown argues in The Death of Christian Britain that in unprecedented numbers, the British people since the 1960s have stopped going to church. According to the English church census, in England, over 3 million people of England's roughly 50 million inhabitants, so 6.3%, attend church weekly. I hope you're not 60 years behind. Contemporary society here might in many respects be regarded as pervasively secular. And often, people think about the swinging 60s and secularization since then. But interestingly, C.S. Lewis 
had a rather different take on this. In his inaugural professorial lecture 60 years ago in this fair city of Cambridge in 1954, he saw secularization as occurring much, much earlier. He said there were three phases in the history of the West. The pre-Christian, the Christian, and the post-Christian. And Lewis saw the momentous cultural changes that that, tra that that transition had brought about, and he identified some of their results. Now, it should be noted that Lewis distinguishes between the personally and spiritually Christian, which he describes as penitent and regenerate, and Christian civilization. It's a good distinction to make. Uh, many endorsing the values of cultural Christianity do not profess a personal faith in Christ. Professor Richard Dawkins, prominent atheist and author of The God Delusion, states, I'm a cultural Christian. In the same way, many of my friends call themselves cultural Jews or cultural Muslims. He likes singing carols. He does not want, he says, to stop Christian tradition. Lewis compares and contrasts his own time here in 1954 with the relatively recent time of Jane Austen. Jane Austen, 1775 to 1817. And he explains, in her days, some kind and degree of religious belief and practice were the norm. Now, though, I would gladly believe that both kind and degree have improved. They are the exception. Lewis considers that this change, which surpasses that which Europe underwent at its conversion, has momentous political, social, and religious effect. Peter Kreeft has pointed out that de-Christianization is happening faster than Christianization did and shows that the last 200 years have seen a greater change than the previous 2,000 years. Lewis depicts the unchristening. He is alarmed at being, he is alarmed at being the spokesman of old Western culture. Yet he presents what can only be described as old European, old Western culture. Addressing his audience here in Cambridge 60 years ago, he states the vast change which separates you from old Western is a chasm. One can imagine Lewis looking directly at his audience, explaining those who are native to different sides of it can still meet, are meeting in this room, telling them, I myself belong far more to that old Western order than to yours. Donald Williams argues that two rival conceptions of humanity stare at each other across a great chasm and that what is at stake is the possibility of a civilization in which man may be whole. But it's not all doom and gloom. On the one hand, of course, Lewis is right. 60 years after he was speaking, here in Cambridge, Western societies might be considered even more post-Christian than they were then. On the other hand, we live in a thoroughly Christian age, according to C.S. Lewis. He declared that what Christ accomplished at his resurrection was this. He has met, fought, and beaten the king of death. Everything is different because he has done so. This is the beginning of the new creation. A new chapter in cosmic history has opened. As everything is different now, we need to ask ourselves, what does that mean for schooling that is taking place in this new chapter in cosmic history? What does it mean? 
Teaching, I believe, will liberate. It will not be crabbed, barren, dull, and lifeless. It will liberate. It will lead to children's liberation. It is apposite in seeking to begin to elucidate the implications of this new creation, the new creation, that we turn to the creation of Narnia. In The Magician's Nephew, when Aslan sings the words that bring the new world into being, Uncle Andrew only hears what he thinks is roaring rather than beautiful music because he has convinced himself that the lion the great lion could not possibly be singing. When the lion sang, he disliked the song very much because the song made him think and feel things he did not want to think and feel. After his refusal to believe, Uncle Andrew couldn't have heard anything else even if he had wanted to. The narrator who sounds awfully like Lewis, remarks, the trouble about trying to make yourself stupider than you really are is that you very often succeed. <laughs> For Uncle Andrew, when the great moment came and the miracle of the animals starting to speak commenced, he missed the whole point. The educational lesson is well illustrated. As the narrator tells us in The Magician's Nephew, what you see and hear depends a good deal on where you are standing. It also depends on what sort of person you are. On what sort of person you are. I want to suggest to you today, in keeping with the vision of C.S. Lewis, that education and schooling should enable young people to see and hear well. It should help them to think and feel well. Lewis believed that the sort of person a child is enabled to become through their schooling is really rather important. In The Abolition of Man, Reflections on Education with special reference to the teaching of English in the upper forms of schools, teaching is seen as an inescapably moral endeavor. And the system of schooling C.S. Lewis observed was one in which the head was educated for academic success, but scant attention was paid to moral and character education. Much schooling today results in the atrophy of the chest, where character is underdeveloped through lack of exercise. Fifty years after the death of C.S. Lewis, 51, serious questions are being asked about whether the chest our moral sense is being well educated. Lewis said that the task of the modern educator was to irrigate deserts, by which he meant that it, it is as just sentiments are fostered, as just sentiments are acquired, that the desert is irrigated. The task was not to chop down jungles, but to irrigate deserts. And today, we're seeing a renewed interest in virtue ethics, which presents us with significant opportunities for reclaiming the virtues. The abolition of man, that section entitled Men Without Chests, is so because the heads, the intellect of the students look bigger than their chests. It is a grotesque and disturbing image. As we are more than a head, Education and schooling that only focuses on this will do a disservice to its students. But what do many schools believe about virtue? Here we come back to the difference between Lewis's Christian old Western view of the world and many of his contemporaries and many people today. Lewis has recourse to natural law, otherwise known as moral law, as the basis for character and moral education. He says it is this concept, whether Platonic, Aristotelian, Stoic, Christian, or Oriental, is the Tao. It's the Chinese term for the greatest thing. It is nature. It is the way. It is the road. Lewis asks us to imagine a completely different sort of morality, 
where a man felt proud of double-crossing all the people who had been kindest to him. And the fact that we do not approve of such behavior is taken as evidence that we have a shared and innate sense of right and wrong. Soccer, football. C.S. Lewis argues, there would be no sense in saying that a footballer had committed a foul unless there was some agreement about the rules of football. In the game of life, we instinctively recognize a foul when we see one. In the New Testament, evidence of the universality of natural law, the Tao, is found in St. Paul's view that those not belonging to the Christian tradition show that what the law requires is written on their hearts while their conscience also bears witness. At about the same time that that epistle was written, Cicero was declaring that there was a true law that is unchangeable and eternal. Lewis uses terms like righteousness, correctness, order, truth to denote the Tao. It is the doctrine of objective value, the belief that certain attitudes are really true and others really false to the kind of thing the universe is and the kind of things we are. Certain responses really are better than others. In a similar vein, Charles Taylor reminds us that for the ancients, the good we love is in the order of things as well as in the wise soul aligned with nature. Recently, in Journal of the Philosophy of Education, Chris Higgins reminds us of this gulf between, between the ancient view and modern values talk. This is what he says. We moderns are apt to say that something is good because we value it, because we value it. A crucial and highly problematic reversal of the idea found in the ancients that we cherish something because of its goodness. So in classical ethics, the good is importantly outside of and independent of our will. And it is this very independence that compels our allegiance and shapes our lives. For Lewis, the entire educational project is fundamentally altered by one's beliefs about the Tao, the existence of objective moral law that compels our allegiance. For those within, the Tao. The task is to train the pupil in those responses which are in themselves appropriate, whether anyone is making them or not, and in making which the very nature of man consists. For C.S. Lewis, we've seen that schooling often fails to nurture the moral character of student. Its, its significance is that the chest is the seat of emotions organized by trained habit into stable sentiments. Organized by trained habit into stable sentiments. Michael Ward uh, spoke about the prioritization given to moral reflection and moral action last week in Oxford. Action matters. We get better the more we practice. If I want to become more courageous, I need to do courageous acts. If I need to become a more patient person, I need to practice patience. Action matters. The tennis player analogy. It's rather wonderful. The best progress is made in character education when a young person cooperates with a trusted adult who has their best interests at heart. When that trusted adult acts as an expert coach and trainer. Lewis says, what do you mean by a good tennis player is the man whose eye and muscles and nerves have been so trained by making innumerable good shots that they can now be relied upon. 
There's much talk in education about allowing students to fulfill their potential. But we need to think about the sort of character a person needs in order to fulfill their potential in life. Paul Holmer explains it this way. When courageousness and fortitude become a habit, and all the virtues have to be customary rather than single occurrences, the individual becomes strengthened and qualified to do all sorts of things that were otherwise inconceivable. An entire range of behavior becomes open to such a person, and so too with the other virtues. Motivation is also an issue. It is possible that the tennis player could hit the ball in anger because he has lost his temper, and that this shot might by chance actually cause him to win the game. But it will not help him become a reliable player. C.S. Lewis makes this clear. Right actions done for the wrong reason do not help to build the internal quality of character called a virtue. And it is this quality or character that really matters. I'm going to read that again. This is what C.S. Lewis says. Right actions done for the wrong reason do not help to build the internal quality of character called a virtue. And this is the quality of character that really matters. Now, of course, everyone's best shots in life have at some time or other fallen short. We can help children and young people strive towards consistency, but we can guarantee that they will not act virtuously all the time, like us. They are human, after all. And how we offer opportunities for restoration and for forgiveness when students and teachers fall short may provide valuable character education. Today, according to Spears and Loomis, education is no longer understood in terms of training that enables us to pursue a true conception of reality. There are indications that the education community as a whole, say Loomis and Rodriguez, in their book on C.S. Lewis, that the education community as a whole has bought into the idea that the traditional conception of knowledge is no longer valued, sorry, is no longer valid and does not believe in an objective reality to knowledge, preferring only to acknowledge a range of subjective interpretations. Lewis shows us that the moment we see the Tao or moral law as a mere subjective product, rather than having objective reality, we cannot even talk, we cannot even talk meaningfully about self-control or any of the other virtues that make us fully human and humane. Lewis saw the danger of schooling, working to persuade children that morality was subjective and just a matter of taste or opinion. What he objects to in his review of The Green Book, The Study of Language by King and Ketley, 1940, is that statements of value are reduced to statements about the emotional state of the speaker or subjectivity. So what does that mean? We've started with the big picture, but what does that mean in the classroom, in children's lives, in teachers' lives? What does, what does that mean in terms of classroom practice? That's, that's what we're moving towards here. How can teachers be virtuous? How can they help their students to be virtuous? How can we cultivate? How can we foster virtue? It amazes me how practical Lewis is with regard to classrooms, uh, with regard to schools, with regard to school leadership. Uh, look at the satire in the silver chair, the satire of the leadership of Experiment House. This is what he says about the leaders. These people had the idea 
that boys and girls should be allowed to do what they liked. And unfortunately, what 10 or 15 of the biggest boys and girls liked best was bullying the others. All sorts of things, horrid things, went on which at an ordinary school would have been found out and stopped in half a term. But at this school, they weren't. Or even if they were, the people who did them were not expelled or punished. Well, often with the intention of preventing the sort of bullying depicted in the silver chair, many schools operate a behavior policy today where students are consistently rewarded for good behavior and sanctioned for misbehavior. You may have been in schools where, in English schools anyway, there are flow charts on the wall. You either flow in the right direction or you flow in the wrong direction. <laughs> Rewards and consequences. But if the focus is on the behavior rather than the person, that in itself can detract from the importance of good character. So for instance, Hook and Vass argue that in addressing inappropriate behavior, inappropriate, not wrong, just inappropriate, inappropriate, inappropriate behavior, you should always make it clear that it is the behavior and not the person you are critical of. Christian version of it is separating the sinner from the sin. This sort of approach is rooted in the psychological theories of behaviorism rather than virtue ethics. So instead of working on the young person, on the young person's character with the young person, it's simply the behavior. It seems that that militates against an acknowledgement by the young person of his or her personal responsibility and free will in decision making. It's not to say there should not be sanctions and rewards, but an ethical teacher will do more than achieve behavior modification. For Lewis, as we saw, the motives for the behavior matters. Well, Professor Diggory Kirk is an outstanding teacher, and he models for us some practices of good teachers good in the Aratheic sense rather than simply the effective and efficient sense of the word good. He's an outstanding teacher. We are all familiar with that line. I wonder what they do teach them at these schools. It seems that Lewis knew quite a bit about cognitive psychology before it was called cognitive psychology, perhaps. There's a spiritual and moral underpinning to Professor Diggory Kirk's teaching. The teaching and learning encounter helps Peter and Susan to live better, and it enables them to understand other people better, especially Lucy. As I say, it's not just about effectiveness and efficiency. It's about the development of good character. So they went in and knocked at the study door and the professor said, come in, got up and found chairs for them, and said he was quite at their disposal. Then he sat listening to them with the tips of his fingers pressed together and never interrupting till they had finished their whole story. After that, he said nothing for quite a long time. Then he cleared his throat and said the last thing that either of them expected. How do you know, he asked, that your sister's story is not true? Oh, but, began Susan, and then stopped. Anyone could see from the old man's face that he was perfectly serious. And we know that Professor Diggory Kirk goes on to explain very logically to Susan and to Peter that either Lucy is telling lies, or she's mad, or she's telling the truth. And as she's neither mendacious nor insane, they should try believing her. But the interaction between Diggory Kirk and the children is instructive in terms of teaching and learning on a number of accounts. Uh, he does not just talk in a monologue with the children passively listening and then perhaps doing some writing. There is real dialogue. 
The children take the initiative. They are the instigators. They take the responsibility for their learning. What we see in the dialogue between the professor and the children is what cognitive psychologists and discourse experts term a series of IRF loops, initiation, response, feedback loops, which good parents and good teachers use all the time, often intuitively. There is genuine dialogue. Real questions are asked to which one does not already know the answer. The learner, the learner asks real questions. It's not just students playing guessing games, trying to think of what's in the teacher's head. The difference between real questions and the more ritualistic questions of, of classroom discourse might be illustrated in this way. If I'm on the train, if I'm on the, the, the platform late and rushing to catch my train to Leeds for my commute to work, and I dash onto the train, and the doors close, and I ask the passenger next to me, uh, have you got the time? And my commuter, my co-commuter, uh, looks at their watch and says, it's quarter past ten. And then I say, yes, you're right. <laughs> Looking at my own watch, I would at the least be thought somewhat eccentric. And yet, that's what happens so much of the time in classrooms. We need to ask real questions as well as ritual questions so that learners grow into the life of the teacher. Well, while Lewis was writing the Narnia novels, many children wrote to him. And you may have read some of the letters that he wrote back to them, published in Letters to Children, a book that is rich in pedagogic significance. Just two or three highlights to, to end. Lewis read and commented on the work that they sent in the way that a good teacher should. But some of his comments might sound a little harsh to 21st century ears when so much that is average is good, or even awesome. <laughs> I've been listening. In reply to one young reader, he wrote, the imagery of your poem, what one can picture, is good-ish. But the meter is surely too much of a jig for so grave a subject. Nor, forgive me, do you handle that meter very well? You make me treat angel throngs a rush as if it were the metrical equivalent of Banbury Cross, but throngs is far too long and heavy a word to be hurried over like that. Good-ish. Well, it's honest. Honesty is a virtue. Yet instead of good-ish, a lot of teachers today would have written, I enjoyed the imagery of your poem. Unlike many teachers today, Lewis does not shy away from communicating some hard truths. He gives honest feedback about the weaknesses of a piece of work. He engages with it on a qualitative basis. He gives expert advice. He gives an expert assessment. He shows the student how to improve. He wrote to a girl, Joan, in 1958 in the USA. He congratulated her on her mark. But she must have explained to him how her grade or how the score came to be awarded we can almost hear Lewis chuckle. What a droll idea in Florida. Sorry, Martha. I was having breakfast with Martha this morning. What a droll idea in Florida to give credits not for what you know, but for the hours spent in the classroom. 
Rather like judging the condition of an animal, not by its weight or shape, but by the amount of food that has been offered it. <laughs> Coincidentally, the first time I visited Florida and mentioned in conversation that I worked at a university, I was asked how many years education I had. I was quite perplexed, found it bemusing, as if quality could be measured in terms of a quantity of years, chronologically. Now, a very important virtue for Lewis with regard to teachers and teaching is humility. He says, if you meet a really humble man, he won't be thinking about humility. He won't be thinking of himself at all. And the most serious vice for Lewis is pride. And he writes about pride in relation to teachers, to students, and to schools. He's also very honest himself. He explains that pride is not pleasure derived from being praised or doing a lesson well, nor is it pleasure derived from pleasing someone that you rightly want to please, nor is pride in one's school or pride in a student necessarily a vice, but it is because it's admiration for the school, it's admiration for the pupil. But for Lewis, it was the posing and the posturing, the sense of snobbishness and superiority, of being better than other people, which was so objectionable. In a letter to his friend Arthur Greaves in 1930, he wrote that he had found out terrible things about his own character. He explained, I catch myself posturing before the mirror, so to speak, all day long. I pretend. I am carefully thinking out what to say to the next pupil, for his good, of course, and then suddenly realize I am really thinking how frightfully clever I am going to be and how he will admire me. Avoiding pride is especially important in educational context, but at a deeper level, believing that you are just as good as anyone else spiritually is perhaps the greatest danger, according to Lewis. To conclude, Lewis suggests that if we make some serious attempt to practice the Christian virtues over a six-week period, we will have discovered some truths about ourselves. Now, it's important not to confuse Christianity and character education. Works are important, but they're no substitute for faith. There is clearly a difference between being good and being a Christian. The biblical message is that all our righteous acts and demonstrations of good character are like filthy rags or a polluted garment. We don't come to Christ on the basis of good character, but by faith. We don't earn salvation by being of good character. Yet, it is when we strive for excellence and fall short that we realize we are in need of redemption. Lewis observes no one knows how bad he is until he has tried very hard to be good. The main thing we learn from a serious attempt to practice the Christian virtues is that we fail and therefore we are in need of forgiveness. One quotation from Lewis to end about qualities of character, qualities of character. This is what he says. The point is not that God will refuse you admission to his eternal world if you have not got certain qualities of character. The point is that if people have not got at least the beginnings of those qualities inside them, then no possible external conditions could make a heaven for them. That is, could make them happy with the deep, strong, unshakable kind of happiness God intends for us. Thank you.